United States at the founding of our republic, after our second revolution, which is the one that the Constitution was written. So here's the initial conditions. In the 1780s, the United States is a uh, basket case. There's 13 sovereign governments. There's 13 states. They have the ability to uh, raise taxes and print money. We have 13. We have uh, a very s a weak center. Does this remind you of anything? Um, we have a very weak center that can print money, can't raise taxes. It's dependent on the individual states for contributions. They typically don't make them. The consequence, U.S. state, every th of the 13 states, they all have debt, and the center has debt. It's going, like euro bonds, they're going at deep discount. Um, government has no ability to, they're going at 10, 20 cents on the dollar. I'm getting this from a paper written by someone at NYU. So what happens is that basically the, cut through a lot of details, the creditors of the government, um, for various reasons, they take over and they write a constitution. Here's another thing we can't do. We, we can't have a coherent trade policy. The British are discriminating us badly in trade. Um, we have 13 different trade policies um, and they're playing one off against the other. And then the Constitution of the United States does the following. It gives the federal government the monopoly to issue, to levy the one tax that really raises revenues, a tariff in those days. It gives the federal government a monopoly, think of what Chris was saying, a monopoly on the ability to have a trade policy. There's a coordinated trade policy. Um, states can't impose import or export taxes. Um, and then simultaneously, the federal government assumes all the debts of the state debts, and it raises tariffs. First thing Alexander Hamilton and, uh, and uh, George Washington did is they raised taxes, and they raised them enough to, uh, they're, they're basically spending 85% of US, of U.S. government revenues to service the bonds. And the bonds go from being a deep discount to going at par. And um, that's how we were born. And uh, we were born with a, um, uh, a determined solution to the problem that Europe is facing now. And it was a comprehensive solution done in a certain order. It was all done simultaneously through uh, something, a process that looks like a miracle. The older you get, the more miraculous, and the more you watch Europe, the more miraculous that you will see. But in terms of, you know, George Stigler said, a war can ravage half a continent and raise no new issues in economic theory. And like Chris said, there's no new issues in economic theory with Europe and the Euro. And um, Alexander Hamilton kind of knew them. The, the difficult thing is the politics, and uh, I can't help you with that. But um, My view is that if the Euro is to survive, it will have to work out, the Euro area will have to work out a way to, um, to uh, share fiscal burdens and um, connect uh, fiscal authority to the ECB in the role of lender of last resort. Uh, right now, none of those connections are clear, and if those connections uh, remain unclear, or people try to go back to a system in which there is, in fact, no central fiscal backing for the ECB, I think the uh, prospects for the euro are dim. Why did Alexander Hamilton want to want to nationalize the debt? Because he wanted the creditors of those individual states to become supporters of the central government, not the state government. So he was he was using some game theory. Um, um, so he saw possibilities like that. So could could something like that happen in uh, Europe? Uh, sure. Are 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 there some people who are betting on that? Yes. Are there some people who are hoping for that? Yes. Um, are there some people who hope the other way? Yeah. So um, we need some, um, that's all.